Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our important webinar on milestone inspections and sinkhole claims. My name is Rache Davis. I also go by Shay, and I will be your host for this session. Uh, so we're all aware of the tragedy of the Champlain Tower South condo uh, collapse in Miami. It was a stark reminder of the critical importance of structural safety and residential buildings uh, in response milestone inspections have been mandated for condos across Florida, uh, aiming to prevent such disasters in the future. However, these inspections, while crucial, uh, do not cover the foundation, leaving condos vulnerable to sinkhole claims. So in today's webinar, we will delve into the implications of these milestone inspections and explore the challenges and complexities surrounding sinkhole claims. We are honored to have two renowned experts with us today who will share their extensive knowledge and practical insights on these critical topics. Before we get started, I do wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Um, again, make sure your video and your mute's on um, until we, or sorry, your video is off and your mute is on um, until we get to the Q&A portion. Um, the webinar uh, probably won't last more than maybe 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then the Q&A session we'll do at the end. So we will have a Q&A session um, after David and Leo go today. Um, so please feel free to either you can submit your questions in the chat during or wait until the end um, and we can kind of just go in order and kind of do an open floor. Um, and then if you experience any technical issues, please use the chat feature to reach out um, and I can take a look at it um, while they're presenting. So first, I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, David Harrow. David's the director of Geo Geo Geologic Services, I can do this, and has been a geologist since the days of Moses, just kidding, not quite, <laughs> but he has been making significant oh. contributions <laughs> to the field since the early 90s. Uh, in 1996, uh, Geo3 Group was established. Um, it's a firm renowned for its expertise in geology and geotechnical engineering. David's impressive career includes being a member of the ASTM committee, the Dam Safety Committee, which for me, it's damn good, uh, and the committee for the 2023 Sinkhole Conference. He's also a patent holder for several groundbreaking technologies, including a sinkhole alert system and the multi-electrode recitivity implant technique, or MERIT for short. Very Say good. that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> David and his team which includes several esteemed geologists, geotechnical engineers, and PhDs have been at the forefront of addressing some of the most challenging geological issues, including those related to building safety and sinkhole claims. With his vast experience and deep understanding of the subject, David will provide us with invaluable insights with the implications of milestone inspections and the critical aspects of managing sinkhole risks. Uh, we also have our other guest speaker here today, Leo Cannon. Most of you are familiar with him as well. Uh, Leo is the Principal Project Manager and a Reserve Study Specialist at Barrel Engineering and Inspection. He is a structural engineer who has been practicing since 2000 and has been involved with Sinkle since 2007. Leo has also served as a neutral evaluator for six years. Barrel Engineering and Inspection is a structural engineering firm that has been in business for over 10 years. With over 15 inspectors, the firm has completed hundreds of milestone inspections, structural integrity reserve studies, or both. Leo's extensive experience and expertise in structural engineering and sinkhole evaluation make him an invaluable resource for understanding the practical aspects and applications of milestone inspections and sinkhole claims. So everybody, please join me in welcoming Leo Cannon. So yeah, let's 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 get started. And then some of you, I, I recognize a lot of the names here. So I'm going to start with a little brief overview of how we got to what now is House Bill 1021. Um, there was the Champlain Towers down in Miami that basically collapsed in on itself. And the Miami Herald has a beautiful article or web series on it. And you can actually watch the 20, 30 second collapse on the video. Uh, it was tragic. Um, 98 people lost their lives. It was avoidable and it was unavoidable all at the same time. And then that's kind of what started the legislative down this path. You were in a situation where boards and their, well, property managers are really subject to the whims of the boards in a lot of cases. They're an advisor, but the board ultimately makes their own decision. 
And the board is, and a lot of boards don't realize this, but boards are basically the officers of multi-million dollar corporations. So your president, your treasurer, your vice president, your secretary, your at-larges, they're, they're officers in a multi-million dollar corporation. They just don't realize it. And that corporation needs some level of oversight, especially when it comes to the health and safety and wellness of the residents. What ended up happening with the with the Surfside Towers, as I more commonly call them, um, through five plus years of neglect, there was, through five plus years of neglect, there ended up being a collapse of the building. It hit a structural point of elasticity. And the way damages work, and, and sinkhole claims are, sinkholes themselves, which could turn into claims, are along the same lines. You end up with, and I love explaining this like a rubber band, so if you take a rubber band and you stretch it out a little bit and let go, it goes right back to the point it was at before. And if you take it a little bit more and let go, it's the same. But you, you hit a point of elasticity where you stretch it out and you let go, and now it's permanently deformed. And then you stretch it out a little further, and then it snaps. That's kind of like how damage happens to these buildings. So over time, damage gets worse. To put it in perspective, you start off with noticing a hairline crack in the side of a building because you're deciding to get an extra year of life out of your paint that's no longer applicable. At that point, the crack starts to grow, water gets inside. If it's wood framed, you start to grow mold. Um, the stucco starts to debond from the rusting lath and starts to fall off the building. The stucco that's now falling off the building could hit someone and cause them to go into the hospital. All of this could have been avoided if you decided to keep to the painting schedule for the building. So Senate Bill 4D, which was created in less than 48 hours, uh, basically decided to try to force the COAs of uh, condominium associations to have a reserve study done. Now, again, I'm not a lawyer and I'll talk a little bit about the bills and stuff from a non-law perspective, but Florida Statute 718, which is related to condominiums, started off by saying that condominium associations should have a reserve study done. That after Surfside collapsed, that was no longer um, a should have it done needed to become a must have it done. So Senate Bill 4D decided to force these associations not only to have a reserve study done, they also wanted a thorough inspection of the building because any members out there of the CAI, the Condominium Association Institute, knows that the inspections for a reserve study are not really technically exhaustive and they're not really invasive and they're not really not invasive either. We're out there counting components. We're out there verifying components exist and we're taking an average life of those components and putting them in a budget so the association knows how to fund for its future. The main purpose of the reserve study is to avoid a special assessment. Anyone that tells you anything otherwise is just, just playing smoke and mirrors. The point of a reserve study is so your association does not have to have a special assessment. It will have all of its major components covered within a funding schedule, and it should be adequately funded. So what was happening for years here in Florida, you ended up in a situation where HOAs and COAs were waiving dues, improperly funding, not having reserve studies done, so we don't even know where they came up with their budget analysis, and they were collecting money. So everyone was everyone in the condo market was living on a discount. They were kicking the can forward down the road. Senate 4D, Senate Bill 4D took that away. You can no longer kick the can down the road. You had to properly fund for your reserves. They told you what components you needed to fund for in a certain way. A lot of it was already in 718 and 720, but they decided that this was one step above. So it forced all these HOAs to not only fund themselves, but then catch up for all the lack of funding they used to have, which has created a small condo housing crisis, which is, it used to be you had condos to sell, now you have condos to list because no one's really buying condos. This should normalize in the next three to four years. Uh, insurance companies are heavily involved in this, forcing HOAs to turn over some of these large components to get these studies done. Lenders are pushing these HOAs and COAs pretty hard on not lending on units that don't have their studies in hand because there's that uncertainty of how high dues might go. Now, the timing of this is terrible 
because we're also dealing with a recession and we're also dealing with the fact that we're in the middle of a of an inflation and skyrocketing insurance costs and everyone wants to blame the, all the, the 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 door knockers and the roofing industry on the, on the rising cost of insurance but that's not it it's just construction costs more after covid you ended up with 12 years worth of inflation in an 18 month period you ended up with this perfect storm of basically pushing the 55 and up community out of their homes they were hoping to permanently retire in and that that that's how the the reserve study came about however the state realized that just saying you wanted a reserve study again i said it wasn't that technically exhaustive it wasn't that you didn't even need to do it by an engineer they decided to add the milestone component to this so the milestone inspection and the reserve study go hand in hand can be done by the same firm should be done by the same firm if the directors are looking fiduciary responsibility is like if you have to do the same inspection twice, do the same inspection by the same firm. Then you can have a cost savings. So the milestone inspection is an inspection just like the reserve study, only its outcome is specifically looking at certain aspects of the building to see is the building safe for its intended use? Is the building habitable? And is the building going to collapse on, on itself? So it becomes a different report that needs to be made. And it's going to cover the components of, as soon as my screen cooperates here, it's going to cover the components of the roofs, the exterior walls and breezeways, the foundations, the balconies, stairs, seawall slash retaining walls. And even that one's a little bit tricky because the seawall slash retaining wall has to be within the zone of concern of the building. If the seawall is outside of that zone of concern of the building, then it's not an analyzed as part of the milestone. But this is supposed to be an engineering analysis of these components to make sure that the building is safe and habitable for use. Now, what's interesting about the Surfside collapse is if it had one of these studies done, the building would have still been condemned. The building was going to fail regardless. What's interesting about that Surfside collapse is uh, initially it was supposed to be a 12-story build, and the building was built in three sections. And after the first section was nearing completion, they realized they had completely gone over cost. So they started cutting every corner imaginable. So where the first section had 24 inch wide columns, the second section had 12 inch wide columns. And they turned some of the support shear walls into a swimming pool. So they basically gutted the structural stability. When they got to the third section, they're like, we'll just add a floor. So now you took a building that was improperly built for 12 stories and you added a 13th story to it. So if you watch the video, you can actually see the building collapse from weakest section to strongest section where that last third actually stands up. Most of the time, the first two thirds are collapsing because it was built adequately. So the state wants us to come in, wants us to evaluate these different components and there's different things that can pop up. Now I will safely say, We've done about 200 of these milestone inspections so far. If you've got carpet in your walkways and your walkways are open air, if you've got tile on your balconies and your balconies are open air, you're going to have problems. I have yet to see a properly maintained condominium association that has tile on its balconies or carpet on the walkways that doesn't have some kind of level of structural damage. Now, the damage we're seeing is mostly stuccos delaminating. Uh, the example I gave earlier with the stucco cracking potentially falling off the wall. Stairways is another big hot button. A lot of times you're dealing with stairways that have metal pan stairs that have concrete that are poured on top of them. We're seeing a lot of rust, a lot of rust bleed through, a lot of rust bleed out. We're seeing that on the stairs. So the, the, those are your big issues. You've got stucco on the breezeways, you've got balconies, and you've got stairs. Seawalls, I mean, we all know a seawall is gonna last about 50 years. You'll start to see the seawall issues of like the capstone starting to crumble, the seawall starting to bulge out, dirt starting to fly outside of the wall, big holes starting to form near the front of the, the wall. I mean, that's that's easy stuff. What becomes tricky is the foundation component. When we start to, we don't have the issues on floors two through eight, but we have issues on the first floor. We have issues developing such as horizontal cracking eight inches above the ground on the base wall when we start to have areas of the fence that might be slumping in a little bit. When the pool, no matter how many times you have it fixed, 
it still loses water over time. When you're having plumbing pipe issues in the ground, like you, you've, you have to repair your plumbing lines that are coming from the street to the building, all of these concerns I'm mentioning right now don't really have anything to do with the building. This has to do completely with what's happening under the ground, and that's that karst activity that David's going to love to talk about. So when we're out there looking at these buildings, we're trying to see, was there something underground that's going to cause issues to these buildings, or is it all just maintenance above the ground? And that's where David's area of expertise comes in. When we notice foundational issues, we notice issues we can originate from the ground up as opposed to the, the, the roof down. That's where the geotechnical aspect has to come in. So at this time, I'm going to turn this over to David so he can talk a little bit about the geotechnical side of things. Okay, great. Thank you, Leo. That was, that was very good. So basically, we all, uh, again, just referring back to the seaside building collapse, the original theories that came out with that with regards to that uh, collapse was several several things come out of that. They thought at first it potentially was a sinkhole and that they focused a lot of energy on determining what was happening in the subsurface. Um, there was extensive amount of geophysical testing and drilling and just to see what kind of collapse it, because the nature of how the collapse looked from the standpoint of the videos that uh, Leo had talked about and other information, it looked like there was some sort of failure in the ground surface. As it turned out, it was not the case, but certainly, um, you know, that was one of the areas that they focused on. So back in 2013, though, uh, do I advance the slides here? I think you, do you advance that or? Uh, yeah, just say next slide and I'll go to the next one. All right, so the next slide here. So this, this is an image of the a three-story condo or that was in um, Kissimmee area and it collapsed into a, a huge sinkhole Unfortunately, there wasn't any loss of life at that, or this may have actually triggered the same sort of response that occurred, you know, to the surfside building collapse. So we, we began looking at this, and as the language became developed for the milestone suspension, we began to uh, take a look at that and see what they were going to do and how they were going to address these issues, because in our opinion, there's two potential issues that can cause a building to collapse in such a manner. One is the building itself, poor construction techniques and overloading, poor maintenance of those things. And that is being addressed in there. What's not being addressed, though, however, is the subsurface and what is happening in there and if there is any potential in there. And we know that from 36,000 sinkhole investigations that have been formed in the state of Florida, during um, the residential kind of craze, sinkhole craze, we know that there are certain pro areas that are prone to that. In this, in this particular area, the Kissimmee Orlando area is one of those areas that, that are in there. But what became more concerning to me was I began to look at the language in the Florida statutes for the milestone inspections, and they literally had taken one of the definitions out of the sinkhole statues and placed it into the milestone inspection requirements. So that became in the, and in fact, it right is, well, I think it's section A to A, it says milestone inspections and it refers to the structural members and primary structural systems as referred to in the sinkhole statute. So to me, that sort of ties those two things together. If you were looking at it from a litigation standpoint of view, some uh, attorney would take a look at that and say, well, you know, then you're supposed to be fully aware of what's happening also in the subsurface because you also are dealing with a definition that describes that in your statute. So we saw some potential liability there. And we thought, well, you know, that liability can extend out through, um, you know, all parties involved. So we get, began to look at that. We had a while back had been developing a system to monitor the subsurface, and that system would allow us to get an early warning of what was happening in the sub, in, going on in the subsurface and decide that would be a, a pivotal point that we thought would be you know, kind of crucial to add that into this. The language, however, didn't strengthen up in the foundational areas in the milestone inspections, leaving this kind of gap in there. So we still believe that this is one of the critical elements that in many cases, particularly 
If the condo associations have had one building that's been remediated by sinkholes, the remaining buildings are still left on the property without any evaluation whatsoever. And what you can see in the left side of this image right here is a is a system that we developed and it sends a text messages out to you in alert system. And that alert system can go to the professionals like Leo and myself as well and give us kind of a warning that we, we can show up and do an inspection, a uh, further detail evaluation of what's going on. If you can go down to the next, the next slide. So we again, looking at that, how would that take place and what, what would be involved in doing that? So we became um, aware of the size of the structures that would have to be dealt with and the number of units and loadings out there. We began to see that in many cases, this is this is an awful lot. In, in some cases, there many of these buildings are on piers, which wouldn't have a relevant in some aspects. In other aspects, it would. And then other ones have basically have strip footers down through uh, the condos, and they would they would certainly have a great impact in that. But we wanted to size this and try to figure out what was going on and how this could be applicable um, to the condo association. So we sort of devised this concept of taking the the system that we have and then it, making it so that there's a low entry point into this, and then the monitoring cost over the period of time would be distributed over the typical size of the building and the number of units, making it make it affordable in that respect. Kind of almost like an alarm system would come to your residential home. If you can go ahead and kind of click over to the next slide. And I'll just go through these real quickly. So these things would be basically in, based off of an evaluation that has either been done or an evaluation that would be conducted. And also uh, the, the strategic locations that would be determined from the size of the structure and what we felt that would need to be looked at along with the geophysical surveys and uh, those kind of certainly some uh, some soul boring testing. So all these things would take into account and we begin to understand how how much of a problem there is. And there are many homes out there right now, many areas that have you know extensive sinkhole development uh, in them and they've been identified during the these insurance processes. And they are basically just kind of sitting around and that you know this you never know when these things are going to go. So this alert system focuses on the actual movement in the subsurface. And what happens in many times is the geotechnical testing is not as accurate as this system, as we can kind of portray this a little bit later on. If you go ahead to the next slide. So this is a, just kind of a, a overview, a little bit of the what the device looks like. It, it's an implant load device. So we push it into the subsurface and the spring compresses and there and it imparts a load onto the soils and the signal comes down through this cable that you see attached in the upper portion it bounces off of the inside of this and reflects back to um, up the cable to give us a signal that everything is okay. It's One okay. the subsurface is, um, starts to weaken, this thing extends outward and it comes to the point that it sends a signal back to us. And that signal then is sent out via the internet to you know uh, email or sms and, and to everybody all the interested parties you go ahead shade to the next one again this is sort of what the device looks like in general it's based off of something called time domain refractometry which is a a, a a system that's been used by the FDOT for landslides what we've adapted the probe that you saw earlier is to the soft soil conditions they're in the state of Florida. So that's what's kind of unique to this patented device is that it allows us to get signals in uh, these really low loaded conditions in the subsurface. So you can kind of move on to the next one. So we thoroughly tested this. Um, we, we built our own specialized test stand in which we stuck these probes down there and went through extensive testing and allows us to understand the functionality of this and, you know, what, what we can see in these large sand column experiments that we conducted here to uh, to test this. So that's my father-in-law who's an electrical engineer is also the, the patent holder for this and myself. You can kind of move on to the next one. And so what are we looking at? So many, in many cases, a lot of times we have been, we've been utilizing this in known sinkhole conditions where there's been a, an obvious portion that um, 
sinkhole activity has been identified in these residential areas, and we install these devices in these particular areas to monitor them over a period of time. There is an activity cycle sometimes to sinkholes, so they, they may go through long periods of time where they're not active, and then something, a triggering event, much like what happened with um, Jeff Bush, who's just living in his home, and then all of a sudden, you know, it triggered and fell in. But mainly what we concern with is the majority of these sinkhole conditions are basically what they call subsidence sinkholes. As material moves downward, it continues to damage the structure, and that damage to that structure just keeps deteriorating it. Of course, the, the large collapses are the ones that are in the media most of the time, but the majority of them cause structural damage, and this is kind of alerts us to this. These probes can be put at any depth, and any number of them can be distributed around in the subsurface, depending on the geology and, and the amount of monitoring we want to do to give us an accurate reading about what's going on in the subsurface. And once we detect something, at that point, we can come out and do some further geotechnical testing and evaluation. And typically, the idea is to save the structure and loss of life, of course, from, any, from it reaching the surface. By detecting it deep in the subsurface, we can mitigate it before it migrates itself upward and it causes structural problems. You can kind of move on to the next one. So there's 13,000 condos, <clears throat> excuse me, that we've identified within the, the sinkhole prone areas <clears throat> and certainly other ones out, outside of that area, which you know could be applicable to this. But you know, again, basically the idea is to do do this like almost like a monitoring system, like you'd have your house. You know, when you need it, it's absolutely urgent to you, for you to have it. You know, it may sit there for long periods of time, but at, you know, when you rely on it, then you certainly want it to be functioning for you. And so it's based on you know, again, just the recurring monthly cost of the monitoring fees and a small upfront fee to allow this to get installed. And we thought that this would be the best approach for the situations for, you, uh, for the condo associations themselves. Okay. So this is kind of a uh, just a little bit of an overview of one of them that we have an, with an active sinkhole condition. We had some subsidence uh, occur in a property in uh, Pasco County, Florida. And so we were called out there to basically kind of once this, they've sort of quit moving around in the subsurface and stabilized itself a little bit, we wanted to monitor that and see if it's going to continue to impact the structure. Now, this kind of alleviated the need to come in and immediately grout this because it was far enough and a little bit small enough away from the home. It may not cause, it has not caused any damage to the structure. So we wanted to see if there's continual movement in the subsurface with that. And you can go on to the next slide. Again, we just play, we place this in a relative position based off of the information that we got, the geotechnical evaluation, which you can see that over here, there were several uh, SPT borings and small, shallower soil density that was performed around the structure to kind of give us an idea of what's happening there, along with the geophysical assessment. Let us focus on the particular area we wanted to look at and kind of gauge it between the structure and the feature that was developing. Go ahead. And this is kind of what it looks like with the geophysical measurements. So we can kind of see the feature there with the little hash lines there right off to the left-hand side of this. Go ahead. And so this is geotechnical borings. So I'm going to just kind of comment a little bit on the geotechnical borings. And, and they are extremely useful. And they, they are the, the center point of all evaluations. However, they do have one particular weak spot is that they're testing one small little tiny area that they look at and they give a relative value of density. They don't determine whether or not the soil is moving or moving or not. And in the sinkhole statues, that movement is referred to as contemporary movement in the subsurface. In order for that to be engaged and the insurance to be engaged, they're looking for this movement. This device is pretty definitive when it comes to that definition. It is measuring the movement where if soil testings are only done and geotechnical evaluation is done, you could end up with an evaluation that shows low density soils, but you may not have active sinkhole conditions. So we see this monitoring device as something that is really beneficial to the, to the associations because it can kind of sit there and be placed into these particular areas of you have problems and really determine whether or not you're going to spend any future money on. 
And that includes the, the cost of remediation, which could be very expensive to do for condos and large structures as such. This is just kind of another example of us uh, putting it and installing it. You can kind of go on to the next next slide. And this is uh, just the, the amount of systems that we have placed in the distribution around through the counties that we've had over the last several years. So we've been monitoring quite a bit of these things in residential sites that were, had uh, confirmed sinkhole conditions. And we have been, you know, upkeeping this and updating our database mainly with these sites uh, over the last five years and kind of just coming up with a statistical analysis. And what we're seeing is in some case, in many cases, we're starting to see the conditions that would be automatically a default remediation by the standard geotechnical evaluations. But once the device is there, we're not really seeing movement. So we're seeing this possibly long-term cycle of sinkhole development occurring. And so the need to rush out and <clears throat> grout the subsurface may not be totally necessary and may be able to monitor this for some period of time to understand whether or not that that is occurring. If it is, certainly you need to. If the device goes off, we would automatically default to you know some sort of subsurface routing or something that would take care of that um, failure that's occurring in the, in the subsurface. We'd want to make sure. But there has been literally millions of dollars in spent stabilizing soils that may not have been required to do that. And because of the detail that was, you know, not afforded to them, simple testing that was done. And then 20 years later, we have structures that are still viably standing at this point. So after that, I'm going to, Leo, I'm going to kick it back to you. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of good information. The key is um, first noticing it from a structural standpoint of when the buildings start to shift and then moving into a process of figuring out if it's related to sinkhole activity, is there a monitoring out there that we can use to monitor the shift to see if it's above or below ground? And ultimately, sinkholes can be very dangerous. I mean, we all saw what happened up in the Land Lakes area about five years ago, which caused a whole bunch of reform to the way that sinkhole remediation was logged by the building department. So it's very serious. We're building more buildings, taller. We're building taller buildings near sources of water as we continue to drain what I call the sponge, which is our limestone layer. So it can be uh, quite dangerous as we move forward, especially the overdevelopment of St. Pete. It's going to be another hot button to watch is that overdevelopment downtown St. Pete as St. Pete becomes the next West Palm Beach. And just, just following what's happening in Sarasota right now is that's becoming another hot button for grounds that are drying up, especially as we go into our second drought season here in Florida. Um, at this point in time, I think it might be good to open up the floor for questions. Would you agree, Shay? Yes, absolutely. Um, so anyone who has any questions, feel free to unmute uh, and we can do an open floor now. I have two questions. <clears throat> one is, um, what is the typical expense of one of these systems? And the other question is is there an application for commercial buildings? Yes, yes, there is. So uh, again, what we're trying to do is put the low low cost entry point into this into this and distribute it over the length of time the cost. So there's um, we're looking at somewhere depending on the building size and the number of units because the number of units of building size are going to go to along together. So you're probably looking somewhere along the line of you know five to eight thousand initial cost just to kind of get everything in there, and then a monthly fee between each unit between somewhere uh, like five to ten dollars per unit, depending on if the average size is in the sixty to one hundred range. Does that does that answer your question? And. Then is there an application for commercial buildings? Yes, yes, absolutely. What's the insurance coverage is still in full effect for commercial and for condo associations if you buy the additional coverage. So this will this will afford you the ability to, if the device goes off, to have this turned in the insurance company. And I think Leo could probably expound upon this a little bit greater, but you would find a little less resistance from the insurance companies if this device went off. Uh, I think it's pretty definitive 
that there is subsurface movement and it's going to impact the structure. And then therefore, you know, the remediation of that could be activated through the insurance companies. They have a tendency to try to shove it off a little bit if there's no structural damage. But certainly I think that if there's a full coverage mechanism, I believe under what you guys have, it would be initiated almost effectively immediately from that. One of, one of the other things we looked at is, you know, the potential for uh, a claim to occur inside the system. So in other words, uh, somebody in a condo themselves, if they claim that they have single activity, um, then the master policy may kick in as well. And if the system is engaged, then it's just a it's just a matter of saying, hey, we're not seeing any movement in the subsurface, and that that can kind of keep that out of the out of from, from happening. Because I I can see where somebody could exploit the system, and public adjusters can go knocking on doors and telling people they'll get the money like they did back in the sinkhole days for residential sites, and start engaging the the individual condos and invoke the master plan from there, which would lead you down the pathway of, you know, having a deductible and then having the property claimed as a sinkhole property if the investigation comes back. And if you're in a karst area, most likely that, that investigation has a hard time segregating out whether that is sinkhole activity or whether the results of the testing that they find is just maybe basically a geologic condition and they really can't rule it out. So that 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 led to a lot of sinkhole claims be identified based off the, the karst geology of the state, not really active sinkhole conditions. Does anyone have any other questions? What well, was done a good job? <laughs> no, I just had to come back and un figure out how to unmute myself. Um, so do you have um, a worksheet of some kind um, for condo board owners to look at so that they can see, you know, specifically what the requirements are and when they need to be done? Very difficult to find it online and of course dbpr has you know is basically no help um and looking at the state statute is very difficult for board members to read so do you have something that you can send to me um so that i can give to my board of, of directors so that they can see you know the time frames what has to be done and and such yeah, for the milestone inspections, I think he's talking about you. For the milestone and the structural uh, SIRS, we don't yeah, think, really here in Pinellas County have too many uh, sinkholes. Um, not been an issue in this county. Uh, any great? Yeah, we, I mean, we have our ebook, which hasn't been updated for House Bill 1021. But the only thing House Bill 1021 did was just make it so. It made it so board members had to be more on the up and up about um, who they could hire to do this type of work. You can't hire a friend, a cousin. Uh, it needs to be arm's length transaction. Also about the website that needs to be uh, maintained by any HOAs that are more than 25 units. So the timeline set forth in the... In yeah, can you is, email me that valid. handbook? Yeah. Yeah, Mark, you can just go to any of our emails that you've received. There's a link in every email because we have the book as is one of our banners in the email. Okay, can you send me an email with that so that I don't have to go look? I would appreciate it. Yeah, we can definitely it. do that. Shay, you have the attendee list, so can you do that after this? Make sure Mark gets a copy of the ebook. Absolutely, and if everyone's okay with it, I'll just go ahead and send out the ebook to the ones that registered. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. That being said, I'd like to thank everyone for oh, stealing Shay's thunder. Go ahead, close this out, Shay. Sorry, I'm going to mute myself. Not stealing. <laughs> They're absolutely fine. Um, we want to thank you all for coming out and attending our webinar.
Um, if you do have any other questions, I'll be sending over both Leo's uh, contact information and David's as well. Uh, so you can reach out if you have any specific questions after this. Um, but we thank you all for joining us, both Barrel and Geo3 Group. Um, we really appreciate you coming out and thanks so much. You guys have a great day.